So thank you to all of those who, you, you who stayed uh, this long till the end of this meeting. Um, you're going to hear the, the final talk, which is mine, uh, treatment of acute respiratory failure. What's the future? And, and as you'll hear, much of some of what I'm going to say at the end is very similar to Jesus' approach because I think there's no question that as we go into the future, the genomic revolution is going to have an impact. Whether it's five years from now or ten years from now, there's no question sort of 20 years from now it will happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it will it'll continue. So what I'd like to do and what I'd like to cover in the next few minutes is how do we deal with obstructive lung disease? So far, this meeting has focused largely on acute lung injury. That was the topic. But the topic I had was the treatment of acute respiratory failure. <coughs> so I'll briefly talk about patient-ventilator interactions. Then how do we treat restrictive lung disease? And I think a major factor here will cl is clearly trying to minimize ventilator-induced uh, lung injury. And I'll talk briefly about imaging, novel therapies, which we've dealt with, and identification of at-risk patients, which actually is very similar to what Jesus uh, was discussing. So let's quickly look at patient ventilator interactions. First of all, let me frame the problem. What is the problem? What's the difficulty here? Well, the issue is we have a patient, and the patient is breathing, usually, or trying to breathe. And what the way that patient does that is clearly there's a signal sent from the, the central nervous system. I haven't shown all the afferent information that leads to this uh, output from the central nervous system. But that sends a signal down the phrenic nerve, activates the diaphragm, you get contraction of the diaphragm, you get changes in the chest wall and lung expansion, and that generates pressure and flow um, and changes in volume. What we do presently, and what the issue is, that we have a ventilator, the equipment, we have this ventilator, and what we'd like to do is we have an oscillator here, and essentially we have an oscillator here. We'd like to link these two in some reasonable way so the two work in unison. The way we're actually thinking about it, the ideal technology, would be to get some signal from the brainstem that says, let's trigger the ventilator from the brainstem. Let's control the ventilator from the brainstem. And that may be possible, you know, 25 years from now or 50 years from now with special, special approaches. Unfortunately, the way we do it currently is by taking measurements of either pressure or volume or something else, usually at the airway opening or the chest wall, and then running the ventilator from this. And as we know, in many situations, that has problems. There are lags, especially in patients who have major airway obstruction or have auto peep, so that the pressures and flow lag behind what the central nervous system wants. A good example of this is taken from a, a study from uh, Tobin, or actually not a study, a review article uh, a few years ago, looking at uh, mechanical ventilation, but specifically focused on patient ventilator interactions. Here you can see here is flow on the uh, upper scale versus time. Here is pressure uh, on the lower scale, centimeters of water versus time. The dashed line, or the dotted line, represents pressure support ventilation, and what the ventilator wants to produce, what we want to produce as, as a physicians. But here is a patient, here are the results from a patient, looking at the pressure. Look how much longer it takes for the patient to trigger the ventilator. The patient generates almost negative eight centimeters of water. Patient, the pressure waveform is delayed, and you can see that there's a bit of a plateau, but then there's a, this increase in pressure at this point here. And then there's a drop. So what's happening here? Well, it looks like the patient is not synchronized, not triggering the ventilator well, trying to push against the ventilator. It looks like the patient's trying to exhale. Let's look at the diaphragmatic and transverse abdominus EMG. This is the diaphragm EMG. You can see the patient is trying to take a breath here. They're actually trying much earlier than the, the, than the pressure at the airway drops, but there's a delay here, a major delay, which causes, uh, which is a, a one form of ventilator patient asynchrony. You can see here that the patient wants to stop taking their breath somewhere along here. The brainstem is saying, that's enough, I want to exhale. And yet the ventilator <coughs> essentially has start, only started to give the volume. At this point, the patient's control of breathing says, whoa, this is, I don't want my volume this high and starts to exhale. You have exhalation, exhalatory muscles firing, and tries to push out, and eventually the ventilator stops. And you can see that this repeats. This is patient ventilator asynchrony. This is a problem related to 
not being able to link here, but rather linking here. And I think it's a good example of some of the issues. Now, here's an example, a clinical example from uh, Rossi, um, Zeno and Rossi, published a few years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a patient uh, on a ventilator, a real patient. And here you can see tracings of pressure and volume. At first glance, this might look like it's reasonable pressure, right? You've got pressure. It's not exactly uh, the patient is triggering. It looks like there's not a great plateau. But look what's really happening here. This is now a plot of esophageal pressure. So this is the patient. Look at how many times the patient is trying to breathe, takes a deep breath that lowers the pleural pressure, gets nothing in. The ventilator doesn't detect the changes. So the patient is getting roughly one breath for every three tries. Gross example of patient ventilator interaction. This happens quite often on our patients, especially patients with COPD. And it can be difficult to detect at the airway opening. I mean, if you look carefully, you can detect it, but I think one has to think about it. And this is what often happens here in terms of patient ventilator asynchrony. We see this as you go, um, as you change, as you change the pressure support level, you can change the patient's real respiratory rate, and you can be very, you can be fooled dramatically, dramatically, you could be lowering the pressure support, all of a sudden the patient's, the rate measured here appears to go up, and if you're not careful, you'll say, well, the patient's not being supported well enough. Well, in fact, what's happened is you lower it sufficiently so each breath captures. So patient ventilator asynchrony can be and is a major problem, often undetected. What are some of the approaches that might deal with patient ventilator asynchrony? One is a technique called proportional assist ventilation that I think you've heard of. Uh, Magda Yunus was the inventor of this. With this technique, uh, the ventilator generates pressure that's in direct proportion, or is attempted to be in direct proportion to the patient's instantaneous effort. The, the ventilator doesn't have any pre-selected value of, of volume, flow, or pressure, and uses the equation of motion. So it uses the equation that predicts based on, uh, tries to predict what the patient is trying to do, what pressure the patient is trying to generate with their muscles based on resistance and compliance and specific factors. One of the issues here is that this requires monitoring of respiratory system mechanics to determine what the degree of unloading is. So if you can have excellent measures of respiratory mechanics online, this might be effective. Here's an example of the same patient, now treated with pressure with uh, PAV, shown here on the left, and showing that each of the breaths is captured in this case. And in fact, you have a very different pattern than during, during pressure support ventilation. So this is a technique that's um, partially currently available in Europe. I think it's, it's difficult because the measurement of, of mechanics online is not perfect certainly has issues. One has to be able to measure auto peep as well to be able to predict the equation of motion, to use the equation of motion. Another approach to neuroventilatory coupling is that in which one looks at measurement of diaphragmatic excitation or electrical EMG of the diaphragm to try and run the ventilator. And as you can see, simplistically, this is much closer to the central nervous system. And you can imagine the delays certainly are not great between the CNS, the phrenic nerve, and diaphragmatic excitation. Those signals travel very quickly. There are certainly some issues, but I think this is, would be much better than measurement of airway pressures and flows at the mouth. This is a technique developed by Christer Cinderby. This was published a number of years ago. Christer is currently at uh, St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto working on, on uh, this technique. Well, how does this work? Well, it's a, um, a very relatively simple technique conceptually, although I think all the algorithms and development was quite elegant. One simply puts a catheter down. This can be a simple um, esophageal catheter. Um, puts it down into the, uh, into the esophagus, and a, there's an array of electrodes along these cath this uh, catheter. The key here is that this is an array of electrodes, and they bracket the diaphragm. The problem in the past has often been if you're trying to measure EMG of the diaphragm, if you try to measure from the surface, you get all sorts of movement artifacts. You don't really get a good diaphragmatic EMG. If you put an, electro an electrode down, when the diaphragm moves, it moves in relation to that electrode 
and you get a, a, you get a, a signal that's not very accurate. I think the clever part here is to have an array. You have the diaphragm moving here, and what the array does is, because it's measuring um, the electrical activity at multiple locations, it, what it does is it says, where is the greatest signal? And then it takes into account, essentially, the movement of the diaphragm. So I think that's the clever part, and that, that's the important part, the algorithm that, that controls, that, that decides which, which, are, uh, which of the electrodes is used, and also getting rid of the ECG. So that's essentially the unit. Um, it then feeds a signal to the ventilator, and that signal can be used to trigger the ventilator, as, or as I can show you, another clever thing that I think uh, this approach might be useful for. So here is triggering of the ventilator. This is taken from that same paper. It shows flow on the upper scale, then volume, then esophageal pressure, and then airway pressure. And you can see here, as in the previous example I showed you, the patient is starting to breathe or wants to breathe at this point, maybe even a little before, but based on pressure at this point here. So esophageal pressure drops. Look how long it takes. This looks like it's about 400 milliseconds. Look how long it takes before the ventilator actually detects change in airway pressure because there's a delay to get the airway pressure. It's not that the ventilator is not doing a good job, but the airway pressure is not changing quickly. And at that point, the ventilator's triggered, the volume enters. With the neural trigger, one can simply see, you can see that here is now airway pressure, esophageal pressure. These are, these are aligned because the ventilator is measuring something, an electrical signal from the diaphragm, rather than trying to wait to see that there's changes at the airway opening. So this would be a great approach, I think, for triggering because it really tells you when the patient is starting to breathe. But that's pretty straightforward. Most triggering is not bad. There's some, certainly examples like this. I think one of the more elegant parts of this, and actually this is another example of, here is airway pressure. You can see that this is uh, the top airway pressure. The bottom is diaphragmatic electrical activity. You can see with a normal triggering mechanism, a number of breaths are missed. With neural triggering, all the breaths are, are picked up by the ventilator. But I think a really interesting approach one can use if one has this EMG is if one integrates the electrical EMG in real time, or essentially in real time, and then says to the ventilator, provide pressure and flow, provide pressure in direct proportion to what the diaphragm EMG is asking for on a on millisecond by millisecond basis, you can imagine that now the patient the, and the ventilator are completely in sync. And that's what this technique, neurally adjusted ventilatory assist, so that neurally adjusted means you're basically adjusting the ventilator based on what the diaphragm suggesting it wants. And you can see what this looks like. This is diaphragmatic electrical activity down here. This here is airway pressure, and this is volume. But look how airway pressure tracks what the patient is trying to do on a millisecond by millisecond basis. In fact, it's delayed by, I don't know, 10 or 20 milliseconds, but much closer than anything else. So I think this, uh, this potentially is a great way to synchronize the ventilator with the patient. What does this look like? This is now in a normal subject. Uh, the bottom, again, is diaphragmatic EMG, airway pressure, volume. As the subject tries to take bigger uh, breaths, different breaths, tries to actually um, breathe at a higher lung volume. And you can see that airway pressure follows what's happening to diaphragmatic activity and is, uh, is followed in their tidal volume. Now, where might this be um, helpful? Well, I think there's a number of areas in which this diaphragmatic uh, or the NAVA can, may be helpful. First of all, better triggering of the ventilator. I talked about that, and there were some good examples. No question that this should be an appropriate technique for patients with COPD who have auto peep. Difficult in those cases to, 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 to know when to trigger the ventilator. In terms of the neural control of ventilation, um, I think that it makes sense that we probably will need decreased sedation for many of our patients. Many of our patients, as you know, are fighting the ventilator, and the approach is taken often by clinicians is not to go to the bedside and say, how can I optimize the pressure support? Do I actually have to lower the pressure support? One of the easiest things to do is just give more sedation. Because clearly, if you give enough sedation, or in the extreme, give, paralyze the patient, you can fully synchronize. You know, you know it's synchronizing with anything because the patient's not trying to do anything. So I think that in terms of decreasing the need for sedation would likely help. Uh, better sleep, 
I think that um, um, there's some uh, data that Marco Ranieri has actually with PAV that suggests that you can get better sleep with a synchroni better synchronization. And I think with NAVA, synchronization will be much better. Ease increased comfort for the patient. I think it's, it has tremendous possibilities for non-invasive ventilation because one of the major problems with non-invasive ventilation is the leak that the patients have around their, the mask. And that leak makes it difficult to know when to start the ventilation, when to end the ventilation. Um, to, to overcome that, to some extent, people use very tight masks. That can cause ulceration on the nose. It's uncomfortable for the patient. With this technique, this technique is essentially independent of leaks because it's the electrical diaphragm, the diaphragmatic activity that tells the ventilator what's needed. So if there's a huge leak, what will happen is the patient's electrical activity the diaphragm will increase. So it can be independent. So in terms of non-invasive ventilation, I think this is uh, um, potentially very interesting. Finally, I think that it may be useful for de decreasing ventilator-induced lung injury. And this is some work that's going on in the laboratory in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Christer and others. The concept here is, is, uh, is really a theory or a hypothesis at the present time. When we take a breath, we have reflexes that's, that stop the breath from, from, from you know, exceeding a certain amount. These are vagal afferents that go back to the brainstem and say, whoa, stop, that's enough. I don't want my lung to be stretched anymore. Well, you know, maybe that's way, one way we auto-regulate and minimize development of ventilator-induced lung injury or breathing-induced lung injury by stopping, ventilate, by stopping the breath. Now, when we sedate patients, when we put them on a ventilator, when we get the, the ventilator push gas in, we sort of completely abrogate that. And we pick, for example, 6 ml per kilo, with this technique, potentially, one could let the patient pick their own ventilation rate, their own ventilation, their own tidal volume. Because what will happen is they'll start to breathe in. When their reflexes say, that's enough, and stop, that's the volume that they'll get. Of course, there's a big hypothesis that we, we don't know if it's correct or not. Uh, the hypothesis is that, in fact, that these, this neural innervation and this neural control is actually functional during acute lung injury. It may not be. It may be destroyed because of the inflammatory response in the lung. In animal studies we've done looking at acute lung injury with NAVA, can't, we, you know, we've compared it to 6 ml per kilo, and it looks a little better in some indices. The tidal volume on these, in these rabbits is about 4 ml per kilo. So it looks like it's less than 6 and clearly individualized from each rabbit. But it's much too worthy to say whether there's any real utility, or will be any real utility in terms of ventilator induced lung injury. Let's go to other approaches now that uh, might be used in the future to address ventilator induced lung injury. Now this is something we've talked about for the last couple of days. We know that increased lung stretch can lead to ventilator induced lung injury, whether it be gross barotrauma trauma or diffuse alveolar damage. We also know there can be adlect trauma with whatever the mechanism is, clearly ventilating at low lung volumes, whether it's effectant surfactant, recruitment, derecruitment, can lead to injury. And these can lead to various types of injury, whether it be biotrauma, pulmonary edema, or other structural changes that you've seen over the last couple of days, perhaps ad nauseum. So what will be happening in the future in terms of trying to minimize this ventilator-induced in lung injury? Well, if we think about the clinical needs for ventilator-induced lung injury, I think that would be very helpful for us to be able to detect overdistension and collapse reopening. By the way, even if we knew that, it would still be difficult. Let's say you knew that perfectly. Does that mean you completely stop collapse and reopening? That might mean very high peeps or very high pressures. Do you use recruitment maneuvers to get rid of complete collapse? How much overdistension and overdistension? Not entirely clear. Even if we had this information, whether we could, uh, we could certainly pick strategies that could be tested, but I don't think a priori we'd all agree on, a, on the best approach. I think, and I discussed this yesterday, and I'll give a, I think I'll give another example of potential non-ventilatory approaches for ventilator-induced lung injury. And then I think identification of patients who are at high risk, I think, uh, is important and will happen as we, as we move forward. What are some of the medical advances that we might correlate with the clinical needs? Well, there's no question that there's been a, a real revolution in terms of imaging for various diseases uh, over the last number of years. And we've seen some of those. We've seen that at the, at the basic level. Uh, we can certainly see that uh, clinically as well. 
We also know that there have been major advances in molecular biology. And finally, there are major advances in genetics and bioinformatics. Sort of if you look at the Human Genome Project is a, is a great example. So let's look now at how can we avoid overdistension and adelic trauma. Well, we've done a, a number, we've looked at this over the last couple of days. I'm not going to review this in any detail. Well, there are improved ventilator techniques for assessment. One can get online PV curves. We haven't discussed that today, but there are ways to do this with slow inflation, measure the PV curve with a quasi-static pressure. Um, you've heard about breath-by-breath -breath assessment of pulmonary stress, the stress index, which uh, the data pre Marco presented yesterday looked quite interesting in patients to be able to predict, for example, which patients in the NIH strategy um, were were in a safe zone and which weren't. And the nice thing about this technique is that one can get changes in this stress index on a breath-by-breath -breath basis. So one doesn't have to do a CT scan. How often can you do a CT scan? Once a day? Clearly, once a day is not really feasible. But this could do this on a breath-by-breath -breath basis. Imaging techniques. I mentioned these CT scans, and I think are, are useful. Certainly very useful in terms of uh, understanding the pathophysiology for research, very useful for certain aspects of clinical care, but to guide ventilators on a regular basis, I, think, I don't think so. Certainly not the way it, it's done in the cost and the, and the radiation dose one needs now. And there are potentially novel approaches, and let me just mention a couple of these. One is electrical impedance uh, tomography. This is a technique... Uh, I don't remember whether we've seen any data on this over the last couple of days, but it's a technique essentially where you put electrodes around the chest. You then generate a small current, small voltage, across pairs of electrodes. You measure the voltage, and because of changes in resistivity of the lung and the airways and the gas, one can get the equivalent of a quasi-CT image of the lung in relative real time and relatively often with no radiation. What does this look like? This is now from a paper quite a few years ago, and the, and the images are much better at the, at the present time. But you can see you get changes in, in over time. This is uh, open lung versus closed lung. You can see the resolution here is, is not very good. The resolution is better now. Nowhere near the resolution of CT scans, even in the best hands. But I think it does have the potential to tell us are, are airway units, alveolar units open or closed. This is from a, from a pig. This is what happens... Uh, in the lung injury model, this is before surfactant administration. You can see after 13 hours and 15 hours after surfactant administration, clearly more gas entering the lung, and you can see the rough distribution. So this may be a useful technique sometime in the future for assessing whether lungs are open, whether lungs are opening and closing. Perhaps, can I have the, the, uh, the other presentation now? Perhaps in the future what we'll have is, is approaches like this where we can real, do sort of real-time bronchoscopy, videography, go down essentially in an imaging technique. Unfortunately, there's too much light up here, but in an imaging technique to see which airways are open, which alveolar units are open, uh, uh, change PEEP, and be able to assess again on a repetitive basis which uh, airways and alveolar units are open. This, this approach, and essentially you can do with bronchoscopy really, but can we do this in some bronchoscopic uh, non-invasive method, and my guess is we will be able to do this in the future, but well into the future. Back to the other presentation, please. What about anti-inflammatory therapies? It's something that um, we've talked about um, over the last couple of days. You've seen a lot of data in, uh, in animal studies uh, that look impressive. Will this be useful? Well, and I, and I went over this yesterday, so I'm not going to go over it in any great detail, but because of the heterogeneity in the lung injury, I think there's no question that certainly for some of our sickest patients, it is not going to be possible to develop a ventilatory approach that's completely uh, non uh, or completely protective. There are going to be some lung units where you just can't uh, get there from here. And this example is just to show you the heterogeneity between the dependent lung region, the non-dependent lung region. As one increased PEEP, you can see the, the effect on gas volume very different in the dependent regions than the non-dependent regions, and here you have a P-flex. Well, how are you going to pick P? How are you going to set the ventilatory strategy? It's not going to be possible in some patients. There's no question. And in those patients, I think it will be uh, potentially useful to look at anti-inflammatory therapies or anti-mediator therapies 
maybe not anti-inflammatory per se, but mediator therapies that may be helpful. One approach that we've looked at in the past is the heat shock response, and Jesus Villar, when he was in Toronto, did a lot of work on, on heat shock. Uh, this one, I think the first author was Sergio Ribeiro with Jesus and others. And the heat shock response, just to step aside for a moment, um, is a response that, uh, that is a very interesting response. It turns out that if you raise temperature just a few degrees centigrade, that you can suppress translation and transcription of most genes. This is a response that's found in all mammals, all living things, in, including plants. What you do get is you get a rapid expression of a number of genes called the heat shock genes because of the effect on heat, but it's not just heat, there are other stresses, so they're also called sh the sh um, heat stress genes. This is a family of intracellular proteins that appear to be protective. The protection has been shown, and this is work that Jesus did, looking at models of sepsis, looking at models of acute lung injury. The precise mechanisms are not clear. It's thought that the heat shock proteins, which are intracellular, bind to, to nascent, to new proteins, and protect them from other stresses as they move around within the cell. That's one of the hypotheses. So we wondered whether the heat shock response might have a role in ventilator-induced lung injury. So we took um, our animal model, we heated the animals, and then waited 18 hours. So, so the animals were only heated for 15 minutes. It takes a few hours for the heat shock response to, to, be, to come into full bloom, produce heat shock proteins. And then after 18 hours, so the animals were at the normal temperature, took out the lungs, ventilated them with the ex vivo lung model we showed you, measured PV curves and cytokines. In the sham group in which we didn't heat them but did everything else the same, compliance of the lung at the end of 18 hours decreased by 45% whereas in the heated animals, it decreased by only 18%. When we looked at a couple of cytokines, and I'll only show, you one, only show you one, this is the control animals after two hours of ventilation with an injurious ventilatory strategy, marked increase in TNF. And the animals that were heated 18 hours earlier, remember, marked markedly lower level of uh, heat shock proteins. So I'm not suggesting we uh, put our patients in ovens as yet or put them in microwaves for 15 minutes. But, you know, we think, you know, if we think about what what the mechanism of, uh, of fever is. Maybe it's protective. Maybe it is protective by mechanisms such as this. And maybe there will be ways, not heating the patient, to be able to turn on this response if it turns out to be useful. I showed you this yesterday, so I'm not going to go over it. Uh, again, suggesting an anti-inflammatory therapy with anti-TNF might abrogate uh, this. We, did, you know, in my and colleagues didn't measure injury, but here PO2 is clearly markedly better and the animals treated with anti-TNF antibodies. Now, which patients might we want to use these therapies in? You know, I mentioned that we might want to use these therapies potentially in patients where you can't get a protective strategy. The other approach might be to say, well, let's look at those patients who we've talked about for the last couple of days that are increased risk for developing something bad happening, and then based on the genomics, say, gee, those patients we should target early, even if they have no other manifestations at the moment, they're likely the ones that have problems. And this is something we've called ventilogenomics. You've heard of pharmacogenomics. Maybe we'll have ventilogenomics to try and mitigate to decrease ventilator-induced lung injury in those patients at risk. So you've seen this uh, data before. I'll just briefly review it again. I think it's important, potentially. This is a study from Marshall in which they looked at angiotensin-converting enzyme. And there are a number of reasons why uh, uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme may affect injury. Um, and these are shown here, changes in tone, permeability. There's other, there's other factors as well. Now, it turns out that changes in ACE can be expo explained by polymorphisms in the ACE gene. And the D variant, the D allele, has the highest, um, the highest activity in terms of ACE. And the hypothesis then is that those patients who have the D allele will have the increased prevalence and perhaps mortality to ARDS. So you've seen uh, this from Jesus just in the previous talk. Appropriate control groups looked at a large number of patients, and here are the results. Patients with the DD genotype had increased um, uh, uh, ARDS compared to other groups, very highly significant. And most importantly, in terms of mortality, pretty dramatic change in mortality. You can see here that if you had the DD, patient had a DD allele, mortality was over 50% versus about 12%. So this suggests this may be an important factor. Again, this has to be replicated. There are many studies like this that haven't been replicated. 
Now, what is the mechanism for this? Well, we don't know for sure, but recently we published a paper. Um, um, Stefan Ulig was part of this. Uh, Yumiko Mai was the first author. This was published in Nature uh, a couple months ago. He looked at the impact of, uh, of angiotensin-converting enzyme in models of lung injury. And we used a variety of models. We used genetically modified mice. We had multiple endpoints. I'm not going to spend very much time just to give you a couple of examples. First of all, in terms of the actions of ACE and ACE2, uh, ACE basically catalyzes ANG1 to ANG2. Uh, it turns out that ACE2 changes ang angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 1 to 9, and also changes angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7. ANG2 is what's thought to be injurious by a number of mechanisms, including via a receptor, the angiotensin 2 type 1A receptor or the type 1B receptor, a different effect on the type 2 receptor. It's thought that injury occurs here. So that's, that's the simplistic model, if you like, of sort of the, the biochemistry. And I'm certainly not a biochemist, but this tells us where we're going. If we look at ACE deficiency, we think that if there's ACE deficiency, as shown up here in the, on the left here, that one would produce less ANG2, angiotensin 2, that one would have less injury. And in fact, when we looked at this, this is now a percent change in elastin. It's just a measure, one measure of injury versus time, and there were other measures of injury, including pathology in, in this uh, study. You can see that this looks complicated, but it's not. This here is the changes in, uh, um, in elastins in the wild type, in the animals given acid. So you can see over three hours, a roughly doubling, doubling of elastins. Here is the ACE knockouts. You can see this is the one homozygous knockout. You can see much less increase uh, in injury over time. It was not 100% protective, but about 50% protective. And that was in the homozygous as well as the heterozygous. So getting rid of, of uh, ACE, as shown here, improved the degree of lung injury, less lung injury. What about ACE2? Because this paper focused a lot on ACE2. And <clears throat> we now looked at acid aspiration and ACE2 knockout mice. And here the idea was by blocking ACE2, as shown up here on the left, that one would have more angiotensin II and therefore more potential injury via a number of mechanisms. And the data are shown here. This is the percent change in elastins on the upper panel, time on the x-axis. You can see here that the wild type, that's the control, is shown here. And you can see in the ACE2 knockout mouse, the mice that did not have the gene to produce ACE2 increased elastins. So a worsening of lung injury. If you look at the bottom panels on the left, this is the PO2, so physiological data. Uh, and just focus on these, these two over here. Wild type with acid, you can see PO2 is about 150. ACE2 knockout, PO2 is around 50. Worsening, uh, worsening uh, oxygenation. When looked at uh, wet to dry weight ratio, you can see the wild type is shown here. The ACE2 knockout has an increase in wet to dry weight ratio. So suggesting that here, this might be the mechanism by which um, ACE and ACE2 might play a role. and may explain some of the background for the genotype or, uh, that I showed you in terms of ACE and why it may predispose to worse injury. So what might this look like uh, in, in the future? Well, this is taken from popular science a little while ago. You know, what's going to happen sometime in the future, I don't know when, we'll come into the ICU or the hospital, We'll each have a genetic ID D card that'll tell all, all our polymorphisms, all our SNPs, um, and basically we'll tell physicians, stick it into a computer and say, which drugs are going to be beneficial for them? What's your prognosis? What are you likely to get? And I think really individualized therapy, as we heard, that it would be ideal to individualize therapy. I think 25 years from now, we will really be individualizing therapy for what we have and what we potentially will get. Again, clearly, this will all have to be tested in appropriate trials. So in conclusion then, I think that uh, if we think about this again as a translational research uh, exercise, which we've been talking about the last couple of days, there's very st strong data in vitro, ex vivo, in vivo, mechanical ventilation can augment lung injury, including upregulation of an inflammatory response. I don't think there's any question about that, and I think all of us would agree with that. At the bedside, we've shown and I don't mean we, but I mean the, the scientific community, the medical community, that if one uses a protective ventilatory strategy appropriately, such as the ARDSNET strategy, that can lead to decreased cytokine trials, cytokine levels. There was a couple of papers. You saw the paper, uh, the JAMA paper. 
but there's a recent paper from the Arsenic group published in Critical Care Medicine early this year. There's decreased organ failure and, most importantly, decreased mortality. In the future, what are we going to have? Well, I think it's important for us. We focused the last couple days on acute lung injury, uh, but in terms of other patients who are being ventilated, patient ventilator synchrony, I think, is quite important. And I think there are improved methods for doing patient ventilator asynchrony. I think NAVA has potential to be uh, an exciting approach. Uh, clearly, again, will have to be tested like any other therapy. Uh, there are novel imaging techniques that are certainly going to explode over the next uh, few years. I think ventilogenomics, uh, looking at genetic predisposition to ventilator-induced lung injury, might be one approach to say who's at risk, who's at high risk for developing uh, problems uh, with mechanical ventilation. And in those patients, maybe we'll use novel anti-inflammatory, novel anti-apoptotic, pro-apoptotic. We don't know yet. But some biochemical approach, some drug approach to try and minimize perhaps a ventilator-induced lung injury, but certainly the consequences of that ventilator-induced lung injury, especially on organ, other organ systems. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.